So we are on chapter 21. It's entitled The Ghost in the Machine. Why human beings are more than matter. All right. So what he does in this particular chapter is he argues with a certain uh, sector of evolutionary biologists who believe that human beings are the sum total of the function of your brain. Okay, so that means everything you do, think, say, everything, excuse me, is simply a function of your brain, all right? So um, they uh, claim to have done some research on this, and in fact, they have, uh, and some of it is, uh, is, is quite uh, convincing. Uh, for example, um, number one, okay, let me start off with this. Um, Christians and most people from various different religious uh, traditions, uh, and even non-religious people for that matter, believe that human beings have a soul right? And that your soul is not a material entity. That's what he means by ghost in the machine. In other words, your body's like a machine, but your soul is spiritual. It's not, uh, you can't account for your soul by studying your body. Because your soul, in some sense, transcends your physical being. All right. Now, um, if these people are correct, that means that we live in a completely deterministic world, which means that not only are animals predetermined, their behavior is predetermined by instinct, okay? So a dog doesn't make a choice. A dog just does what its instinct tells the dog to do. And uh, a rock doesn't choose to roll down a hill. Gravity does that. So if we're no different than the animal kingdom, then we too are, uh, p are creatures whose behavior is predetermined. That is to say, it is caused by something. Uh, usually what the argument is that it's caused by the, uh, the neurons in your brain firing. All right, so, so many of these folks believe that your brain is like a computer. It's extremely complex. It's more complex than any computer we've ever been able to create on our own. But nevertheless, it's like a computer. And um, uh, computers don't make choices, right? They just do what they're programmed to do. Similarly, according to some folks, uh, human beings are predetermined to do whatever their brain function tells them to do. Now, what are some, some of the arguments used in favor of this particular view? Well, for example, suppose uh, a person is diagnosed with either Alzheimer's or dementia, okay, which affects their, their, the neurons in their brain. Um, what happens to them? Well, when in, the, in advanced stages of Alzheimer's, 
uh, and, and I know this because I've, I've encountered people who have this disease, um, you know, they can get to the point where they don't even know who they are anymore. They don't recognize their spouse. They don't recognize their children. Um, you can't say that they really make choices. Um, you know, they, they, they take total and complete uh, care so that there's, there's facilities that are designed entirely to care for patients who have advanced stages of Alzheimer's disease or advanced stages of dementia. I'm not quite sure what the difference between the two are. Maybe Alzheimer's is a specific form of dementia. I, I don't know, I'm not a expert in the brain or, or an MD, so I don't know for sure. But in any case, um, you know, people who have Alzheimer's don't experience reality in the same way that we do, okay? Because their brain no longer functions. All right, that's one argument in favor of the view that everything we say, do, think, etc., is a function of our brain cells. Okay, another argument is that um, um, there have been experiments done on what parts of the brain are responsible for different aspects of our, uh, our, our functioning. So, so, so experiments have been done where they put electrodes in certain parts of the brain. And when they um, stimulate that part of the brain where the electrode is in, then you will experience whatever part of the brain, you know, they are dealing with. So for example, they can make you all of a sudden experience hunger. They can make you um, experience certain kind, certain states of emotional states uh, and, 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 and so forth. So it appears as if there are parts of the brain that, well, it doesn't appear, it's clearly the case, that different parts of the brain are responsible for different aspects of our human functioning, okay? And that um, according to evolutionary biologists, um, the, the back part of our brain is similar to that of an alligator. It's similar to that of an alligator. Okay, an alligator simply um, acts on uh, instinct. Okay, so it, it's, it sees something that <clears throat> that that appears to it to be food, and it immediately goes and it eats that thing. Okay, so there's no you know, sense of an alligator making a choice or, um, uh, you know, higher functions of the brain. It just has that one, one part, one, that one single part. All right. And um, finally, <clears throat> there have been people who have experienced injuries, brain injuries, okay, uh, certain parts of their brain have been injured. Uh, either they fell or um, something fell on them or something happened. And uh, the part of the brain that was injured uh, no longer enables them to do certain things because that part of the brain was responsible for those particular functions. Uh, I remember listening to, oh, I forget who it was. I, I listened to books at, when I commute into work in the morning. And uh, one guy was talking about how um, 
a certain psychologist back in the early part of the 20th century uh, gave up on the idea that we have a soul because he noticed that when certain portions of the brain no longer functioned, that that person then uh, was disabled in terms of their ability to do what that part of the brain was responsible for. So he came to the conclusion that we, uh, in essence, are simply pre-programmed in our brains, you know, to do the things that we are able to do. All right, so one of the, one of the consequences of that point of view is determinism, okay? That's a philosophical concept, which means that everything is predetermined in advance. There's no such thing as um, different alternatives. Everything we do is predetermined in advance. All right, so that leads me to the second consequence of this point of view, and that is that there's no such thing as free will. Okay, if, you, if your brain uh, determines what it is you think, do, and say, then you're not making a choice. You're just, you're just simply following what it is your brain tells you to do. So free choice, according to some people, is an illusion. We, we feel like we're making choices. So for example, when I'm sitting at, uh, on my desk, at my desk in the morning, um, I've got a pad of paper in front of me. I'm working on a sermon, but I also have a cup of coffee there. And I also have a Coke in case I get thirsty. So um, to me, it feels like I'm making a choice every time I stop writing and decide to take a sip of coffee or uh, I take a sip of Coke and then I start writing again. It feels like I'm making a free choice. But according to these guys, I'm not making a free choice. I'm just doing what my brain is predetermined for me to do, all right? So, um, you know, and, and, and that leads to <laughs> yet a third consequence, which is that people cannot be held accountable for their behavior, right? Now, you can argue, well, you know, for the sake of the safety of other people and the safety of society in general, you have to uh, isolate um, and put in prison people who are um, violent and, and, and apparently can't control themselves from being violent. All right, so you could argue that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the person who's violent or the person who's locking them up is making a free choice. It could be that it's simply a function of the brain. The brain is telling you this person is dangerous. So you lock them up. You're not choosing to lock them up. Your brain is telling you lock them up for the sake of your own survival. Uh, whereas uh, the violent person is just, you know, out of control. All right, so that, so there's a lot of very, um, what I would call disturbing consequences to this idea, even though there is some evidence to suggest that this idea may have some validity to it, I don't think we want to live in a world where, uh, where, where our understanding of human behavior is that we're just simply pre-programmed like a computer. What, what, what about falling in love and choosing a spouse? What about deciding to have children? 
What about choosing a career? What about all of the important things we do in our lives? I mean, if we're just predetermined to do those things, then it's not because we find meaning and purpose in those things. It's because we're predetermined to do those things. So, so there's some really rather disturbing consequences to this particular point of view. On the other hand, there is also some rather obvious evidence that would suggest that this point of view is not, in fact, correct. All right. So, um, for example, um, do I say I have a brain or do I say I am a brain? You have a brain. I have a brain. Do I say I am a body or do I, do I say I have a body? I have one. I have a body. Um, do I say, uh, you know, I am my thoughts and feelings and choices or do I, do I say I make choices? In other words, what is this I, when I say I have something, what is that I? Brain. <laughs> okay, well, if it's if it's if it's only your brain, then it would make more sense to say I am a brain. See, whenever we whenever we whenever we we uh, um, whenever we use the word I or whenever we call another human being a person, not just a body, we are suggesting that there is an aspect of ourselves that transcends our physical being, okay? I don't reduce my sense of self to the organs in my body. When I say I, I'm not referring to the organs in my body, including my brain. I'm referring to my personality, who I am as a person, right? Okay, so, um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense in which human beings, <clears throat> unlike other creatures, have a sense of self that is not predetermined. Okay, so um, let's think about that for a minute. What are some of the things that go into each individual's sense of personhood or self? What are some of the things that determine my personality, my, uh, you know, uh, the choices I make, uh, the things I like, all those things we associate with our personality. What are, what are some of the things that, even my behavior, what are some of the things that go into that, that shape that sense of self that we have? The values. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Values, okay, there you go. Values is one very important aspect of that. Values. Um, how could you possibly reduce a person's values to the function of neurons in their brain? I don't see how that would be possible myself. Um, values are... Um, you know, a, a 
are are something that that um, that I hold dear, uh, whether it's uh, that I I value my marriage or my children or my job or you know uh, um, the ideas I have about things, um, all of that is a function of a self that can't be reduced to simply your 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 the the functions of your body okay human beings have a sense of self that that transcends uh their physical being okay um let's take another example um, when I'm sitting in uh, Symphony Hall in San Francisco, which Kirsten and I used to love to do, every, every season we bought, uh, they have this package deal, right, where you can, you can buy like, like four uh, tickets to, to different, and then you can choose which musical events you want to attend. Um, suppose that we're sitting uh, in Symphony Hall and we're listening to Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, his pastoral symphony, which is one of the most beautiful pieces of music that has ever been written. Um, is my ear just hearing notes on a page or am I hearing beauty you're hearing experiences in your life based on choices that you made in your life to develop skills that help you to appreciate yeah. music, art and all things right right i'll never forget the first time i walked into the sistine chapel how many of you have been to the sistine chapel okay if you're in there and there's not a lot of other people in there, so you can just really take it in. It's, it's absolutely, to me, it's a miracle what you see. It's an absolute miracle that one guy could paint this whole thing. What you experience when you're in the Sistine Chapel is overwhelming beauty. That's what you experience. You don't just experience the sensations uh, of your eyes. Y you know, you, um, there's, a, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a sophisticated um, sense of, uh, of being able to perceive what you see as an object of beauty not just colors on a wall, right? Uh, and the same thing with, uh, with uh, a, a, a symphony, for example, uh, it's the same thing uh, with that. So, um, so, so a, lot of this, a lot of this to me seems very similar to the discussions that are in uh, parent raising circles about nature versus nurture, right? Yeah. Are yeah. your children just born a certain way? In which case, whether you parent them or don't parent them, doesn't really matter. Or do you have control and influence how they turn out based on the parenting decisions that you make? Right, right. Okay, so, uh, so I recall those discussions in, uh, in some classes I took when I was in college. And, um, but it really wasn't until I had my own children that I came to a strong opinion on this. You know, our, our, I'm sure your, your experience is the same, Judy, and, and any of you who have had children probably have had the same experience. Um, there are ways in which you can influence who your children become 
but there are also there's also a sense in which your child is going to be unique, right? Yeah. Our two boys' personality is completely different. Okay, Eric is kind of reserved and reflective, and and uh, he doesn't say a lot unless he's engaged with somebody he really knows well. Uh, but when he is engaged, he's highly intelligent and he can talk about just about anything. Carl is, uh, you know, I'll never forget when we moved to California in, in 94. Um, we attended um, some kind of sporting event at the elementary school Carl was going to. He was in third grade. And in a matter of one week, he had a large circle of friends. Took him no time. Yeah. Whereas Eric, he had one best friend. One best friend. Which he is best friend to this. To, he lived in, you know, and, um, coincidentally, he moved to Hong Kong when Eric moved to Hong Kong. Not because it was planned, it just happened that way. So it was a good thing, but uh, you know, he, he's, he's, he's Chinese, but, but he was born in this country. His, par his parents immigrated here. And uh, so he spoke Chinese, but he and Eric were like this. And uh, uh, so they're, they're very different personalities. And yet at the same time, um, I can also see both the genetic inheritance of Kirsten's side of the family and my side of the family in both of them. And I can also see the influence we've had on their, the way they think about the world. So, you know, all those things go into it. Um, so um, I think there's an element of, of nature to it in the sense that we all have a genetic inheritance, but nurture also has a lot to do with how our, uh, you know, the other day, uh, just to give you an example of how wrong this can go, um, uh, Kirsten had a client, and whenever I talk about her clients, I always disguise it so that because it's, I'm not, it's against the law for me to talk about her real people. So I'll disguise this for the sake of an illustration. She had a client who was a young guy and uh, he grew up in a home where his parents were, it was a bad marriage and his parents were constantly arguing with each other until it got to the point where each of them would go to their own separate rooms. They never even talked to each other. And they each had their own way of cooking their own meals in their own separate rooms. And this gal now, because she was never parented, is having major, major problems. I mean, uh, it's going to take a long, long time for her to work through all of the stuff that she's going through. So um, you'll notice I first said a guy and then I said a gal. That was to <laughs> disguise what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't want you to know whether it was a guy or a girl. <laughs> okay. So, um, so according to uh, D'Souza, he, he lists a number of things here um, that uh, suggest that human beings are in fact more than just our bodies, all right? Uh, for example, he says the brain 
doesn't feel, hear, or think. I feel, hear, and think. Um, the brain doesn't have a sense of self. I have a sense of self. Um, also, all of us have an internal life, right? I, I have my own thoughts, feelings, attitudes, biases, all of those things that are internal to myself. Okay, so that's a part of uh, that's a part of what makes up my spiritual side, not my physical side. Okay, so um, you know, if I'm feeling nausea, that's a physical symptom. Um, uh, if I'm feeling pain of some kind, that's a physical symptom. But my thoughts and my feelings and my convictions, that's all internal to myself. And it's, it, it, it's my, part of the, my unique makeup. Um, the same is true with respect to uh, the choices we make. Okay, if... If, if our behavior is predetermined, then how can we identify good from evil? If we're predetermined, we, we can't, there is no good or evil. Okay, and there are people who say that. There are people who say there's no such thing as good or evil. There's no such thing as values. There's no such thing as free choice. There's no such thing as all of that. It's simply that um, if we're lucky, we were born into a situation that enabled us to live uh, uh, a relatively long and um, meaningful life. And after that, there's nothing. That's the end of it. You're done. So, um, seems like a rather um, dim view of human life to me. Okay, now before I get into the religious side, I want to quote one other guy. Eric uh, took philosophy when he was at New York University, and he had a class by a guy who uh, studies what is called the philosophy of mind. Don't ask me what that is, I have no idea. But he wrote a book, and in that book, he said it is absolutely impossible to cross the barrier between the physical function of the brain and our consciousness. The fact that we are conscious of ourselves and of the world around us, okay? You can't, consciousness is a, is not is is not physical. It's uh, it's spiritual, and according to him, even if we are just you know the function of our brain, there is no way for human beings to figure out how to cross that barrier between the chemistry of the brain. And the fact that you're a conscious creature, that you're conscious of the world around you, that you're conscious of yourself, that you're conscious of other people. And moreover, that you have a conscience. 
a conscience that tells you what is good, what is not, what is the right thing to do, and what is the wrong thing to do. These things are spiritual things. They're not, um, they're not things that we can possibly um, explain through uh, communications of neurons in our brain. That's it's simply not possible. Okay, and and then finally, he says, according to him, the best argument against materialism is free will. Okay, we all make choices. And um, the fact that you can, um, let's take an example. According to evolutionary biology, we are genetically programmed to reproduce. That's part of our genetic inheritance, our genetic heritage. Um, because according to the theory of evolution, you know, creatures reproduce and the ones who have the characteristics that enable them to survive are the ones that are able to reproduce again. So they pass on those characteristics. That's called the survival of the fittest. All right. But... Are we able, if we so choose, to not have children? Do you know people who have made the decision not to have children? Yeah, my oldest brother, for example. Uh, it's not that he doesn't like children. He just didn't feel like he'd make a good father. So he made, he, he probably, he, he made the right choice, probably, uh, because he was totally immersed in his work. That's the kind of life he wanted to lead. So he made a conscious choice not to have children. Okay? So, well, if we're predisposed to reproduce and we, and we don't have free will, then we would all reproduce. But if we can make the choice not to have children, that suggests that we have the freedom to make choices that go against what nature builds into us genetically, okay? Um, and, and all of us make, you know, make hard choices at times, choices that are sometimes not in our own interest. Um, if I decide, uh, well, let me give you an example. Um, when Kirsten had her, her bike accident, you know, some guy was driving by in an SUV and he saw her fall over. Well, he could have just kept driving, you know, because who's she to him? He didn't know her. And, uh, you know, he had things to do. I'm sure he had places to go. But what did he do? He turned around. He parked his car in, in front of the sun so the sun wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, be on her while she laid on the ground there. He called 911. He got the ambulance there. He told the story. And then he asked them, do you need me for anything else? And they said, no. So I thanked him profusely and off he went. So altruistic behavior, behavior that we engage in purely for the sake of the good of another person and behavior that, 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 uh, does not further our own personal interest in any way um, 
is, um, I think, the exercise of free will. Okay. All right. So getting into the... Um, Getting into the uh, religious aspect of this, obviously, um, if there was no free will, uh, religion would make no sense whatsoever. Because religion is all about making choices. Religion is all about values. Religion is all about um, deciding... Uh, to lead a life that is built on a moral foundation that is pleasing to God, okay? According to uh, Genesis, each of us was created, what? What does it say? In the image of God. In the image of God, that's right. Well, if we were created in the image of God, obviously free choice the ability to make free choices regarding good and evil right and wrong is is a capacity that we have all right so um so the the the, the materialist um point of view that all we are is our bodies um I think the evidence is quite to the contrary, that in fact, what we call our self or um, our uh, values, uh, what we find meaningful in life, um, our choices and so forth, these are all a function of what we mean when we use the word soul. Okay, does that make sense? It does, but one also has the ability to choose. The soul can make choices and those choices can be to believe in a God or to not believe in a God. That's true. That's very true. I mean, if, if, um, if God wants a creature who has the ability to freely choose between good and evil, which the Bible suggests God wants, then God is taking a risk. Mm -hmm. And that risk is that some people will choose evil over good. But not choosing to believe in the same God, because there are, se there are several gods believed yeah. in by many people. Yeah. Not choosing to believe in the same God is not necessarily evil, is it? No, 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 no. I no, I would not. I would not suggest that at all. However, I I would I would um, point out something about now. Each religion has different doctrines about. Um, the consequences of choosing, uh, you know, the wrong thing, of, of choosing to do evil instead of good. All the religions have different ideas on the consequences of that. Now, the Abrahamic religions, which include Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, because they all trace their heritage to Abraham, all have somewhat similar views about that. All right, not exactly the same, but similar. All right, but if you were to um, look at the beliefs of both 
Hinduism and Buddhism, their point of view is different. Their point of view is that if in this life as a human being, you choose behavior that is harmful to others, that is evil, you choose to, to lead a life of fraud where you steal, you, you know, a debauched life. If you choose to lead the life of a criminal or some kind of debauched life, they believe in uh, what is called karma. You've heard that word. You know what karma is? Karma means that you're, you're going to be reborn after you die as a lower creature. You might end up being a cockroach. <laughs> no, it's true. You know, and and this this became an issue. Um, this became an issue uh, when. Um, do you remember? Right, uh, I don't know if it was during or after the Vietnam War, when uh, a guy named Paul Pot took over Cambodia. Uh -huh remember that yes okay under his regime he committed genocide okay and uh of course next to hitler and stalin you know he didn't come anywhere near murdering as many people as they did because the population of cambodia is so small but he did commit genocide and many people suffered especially famine and hunger under the Pol Pot regime. And uh, some uh, Christian relief organizations went to Cambodia to try and help some of these people. And they asked them, why aren't your Buddhist monks helping you? And their answer was, that, well, because according to the tenets of at least their version of Buddhism, there's various forms of it, like there is of Christianity, but according to their version of Buddhism, every person has to work out for themselves how to deal with their own suffering because how you deal with your suffering will determine you know your karma whether or not you uh spiritually grow into a um higher level of spirituality if you deal with your if if you if you have endurance, courage, and the ability to suffer patiently, you will grow into a higher level of spirituality. If you don't, then you will fall to a lower level. Okay? So that was the answer they were given. Whether or not... Um, other versions of Buddhism believe that or not. I, I can't tell you. I'm not an expert on that. But so were those people um, receptive of the Christian help then? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, they were starving. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were starving. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know exactly what happened, but something happened to the rice crop. I don't know if it was burned or if it was something happened to it, but they didn't have enough rice to, to feed everybody. So there was starvation. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Can I just mention one quick thing here? I remember reading in, in the last 10 years that an experiment was done with a person who was nearing death in the hospital and they weighed this person down to the, to the gram 
And after the person died, they weighed them again and they lost a few ounces. <laughs> and they were saying that was the soul. <laughs> the Is that soul right? yeah. weighs a certain number of grams and it departed the body. And so now the body weighed less. Yeah. Well, um, I can tell you another story and then we'll close with this. Um, there was a, uh, there was a gal who was pronounced, um, or maybe it was a, a young man, I don't remember. Anyway, the patient was declared clinically dead, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, they were able to, uh, I suppose they used the, those shockers. Anyway, they were able to bring him back. And he said that during the period when he was declared clinically dead, he had left his body. And they, of course, the doctors were skeptical, right? And so they asked him to describe what he saw. And he described exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's that. But I wouldn't hang your hat on that experience. I mean, that's just one <laughs> among many. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I won't test it. <laughs> No, no, I wouldn't test that one. No, I wouldn't test that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, right now we are on the section entitled Christianity and Morality. And um, the next chapter, which I think is a, uh, is a good one, it's, it's relatively short. Um, so, uh, you know, it's possible that we could, um, we could uh, venture into chapter 23 as well, but it's entitled The Imperial Eye When the Self Becomes the Arbiter of Morality. So um, it's about how uh, how we how we develop into moral creatures. I think is what it's about. So that's what we'll cover next time. Okay, thanks for joining me, everyone. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. Yeah. we'll see you next time. All right. Okay. okay. <laughs>